This episode is brought to you by SAP. First, the bad news. SAP Business AI will not help you generate cubist versions of your family's holiday photos, but it will help you understand which supplier is best to help you roll out your plant-based packaging in Southeast Asia, or identify the training your junior project manager needs to rise up the ranks, or automate repetitive tasks while you focus on big innovations. So you can be ready for the next opportunity. Revolutionary technology, real world results. That's SAP Business AI. Slate's Ben Mathis Lilly. He knows exactly how a lot of you got the news that Florida Governor Ron DeSantis was suspending his presidential run. Because you know what? He was getting those texts too. People sent it to me with usually uh, a comment such as LOL. Which I think speaks to the way that DeSantis went into the race. Uh, he, he went in hoping to really bother uh, people in the mainstream press. He went in b- hoping to bother liberals and Democrats. He succeeded. Yes, exactly. But obviously then when you end up failing in such a high profile way, there's going to be a lot of schadenfreude on, on your way back down. The first sign that DeSantis was seriously rethinking his run for the White House came Saturday night. That's when he started canceling appearances on Meet the Press and Cable News. Within 24 hours, DeSantis was tweeting out a video in which he was suspiciously removed from the campaign trail. Greetings from Florida. Okay, you know what struck me about this video? Ron DeSantis seemed incredibly comfortable. You can even see, there's like a little sparkle in his eyes here. It's clear to me that a majority of Republican primary voters want to give Donald Trump another chance. He seemed relieved. A man who's finally at ease. It's very brightly lit and the flags in the background are really popping out. Because we can't go back to the old Republican guard of yesteryear, a repackage formed of warmed over corporatism that Nikki Haley represents. Yeah, I would have advised him to use this aesthetic in more of his uh, campaign materials. There are some observers who thought this moment was inevitable, that DeSantis just did not have the juice to make it on the national stage. The thing is, Ben Mathis Lilly has never been one of those observers, even after DeSantis came in 30 points behind Donald Trump in Iowa. Ben was convinced the Florida governor would simply hang in there. You know, in the near term, I thought his strategy was not crazy. But yeah, I mean, he wasn't he wasn't winning this race. So I'm not surprised that he decided to cut it short instead of just uh, losing and losing and losing and losing over and over again, because he's, you know, he's a pretty young guy. Uh, he, He could have a future in national Republican politics down the line. So it's not as if he can never come back. Today on the show, Meatball Ron gets lost in the sauce. I'm Mary Harris. You're listening to What Next? Stick around. This episode is brought to you by Splunk. You need to keep operations humming around the clock, but potential disruptions are everywhere. Splunk helps you predict problems and find and fix issues fast, so you can reduce risk and ditch downtime. The world's largest enterprises rely on Splunk's unified security and observability platform to become more efficient, resilient, innovative. With Splunk, you can react quickly, evolve faster, and be ready for anything. Stay ahead of disruptions. Learn more at splunk.com slash resilience. This show is brought to you by Discover. You know, in today's world, it can seem that the best treatment is reserved for only a few. Well, Discover wants to change that by making everyone feel special. That's why with your Discover card, you have access to 24-7 live customer service, as well as $0 fraud liability which means you're never held responsible for unauthorized purchases. Finally, no matter who you are or where you are in life, you'll feel special with Discover. Learn more at discover.com slash credit card. Limitations apply. Part of what I think is interesting to me about Ron DeSantis leaving the Republican presidential race is that he hasn't officially been in the presidential race that long. Like, he announced his candidacy less than a year ago. Trump, on the other hand, has been running for 
more than a year, for a very long time. Yes, exactly. I mean, so if you look back, I think this race really starts the night of the 2022 midterms. Before DeSantis was even declared. Before DeSantis was declared, uh, when a lot of the candidates that Trump had most strongly supported and which he had uh, really like, you know, made an effort to brand as Trump style candidates, that'd be Dr. Oz in Pennsylvania, Herschel Walker in Georgia, uh, Blake Masters in Arizona. A lot of these candidates across the country lost, uh, especially in the Senate. Uh, the, The Republican Party did much worse than it was expected to in the House. So Trump was looking weak. Yeah, that was probably a moment in which even the most partisan Republicans might have had cause to look in the mirror and say, like, we seem to be doing poorly in elections. Every time this guy, Donald Trump, is the most prominent person in our party, maybe we should think about doing something else. And it seemed like Americans were thinking that, too. Like, there were polls that were showing Ron DeSantis getting pretty close to Trump in a head-to-head race, right? Yeah. So right right after the November 2022 election, you saw DeSantis shoot up in the polls almost 10 points, and you saw Trump start to sink. Uh, and that trend kept going for a while, and they got closer and closer. And at one point, if you look at the the real clear politics uh, polling average, which is the, the one I happen to use, because uh, it ag- aggregates all the polls together, you had DeSantis coming uh, within 15 points of Trump or so. And then where the polls start going the other direction and then they never really stopped was when Trump is indicted in Manhattan uh, by the district attorney for alleged crimes related to his payment to Stormy Daniels. So the indictments begin to have this like rally around Trump effect. Exactly. So the Republican electorate feels that this is unfair. Uh, Trump is being persecuted. Reminds them of all the grievances they have at the mainstream media and the deep state that Trump had had rallied the, uh, around himself during his presidency. And uh, if you look at how DeSantis handled that, he said that it was a weaponized prosecution and that he hoped that uh, no one else would charge Trump with any more crimes. So boosting Trump while running against him or preparing to run against him. The only thing he did was take uh, what a recent reporting suggests was kind of an ad-libbed swipe at Trump by saying, well, personally, I don't get involved in porn star hush money payments, something like that. So a sort of like mumbled insult, but like not, it's not a full-throated anything. Yeah, kind of like taking like a half of a cra- half of a swing, like a check swing uh, <laughs> at Trump. But then, of course, he followed it up by by saying, you know, but I, I think this is ridiculous that they're doing this to him and it's unfair and and essentially acting as if he were Trump's attorney. And and then that continued to be his reaction every time another indictment landed against Trump. And it was the same old strategy that dates back to the 2016 primary in which all the other Republicans said the quote that it was, was always in circulation was he's going to collapse under his own weight uh, and that the, the circus surrounding him would eventually alienate uh, his supporters, which it, it never has. And so from that point on, you can just see DeSantis declining further and further. So DeSantis enters the presidential race while his star is fading. So yeah, DeSantis doesn't enter the race until May. He tries to launch himself in a kind of happy, positive way as this uh, guy from Florida, the state of freedom, uh, who has a, a great family and served in the military, running basically a very conventional campaign that barely acknowledged that he was, you know, would have had to come from behind against a much more popular and well-known candidate. So he kind of tried to act as if he was the front runner. Hmm. Uh, And he tried to carry himself that way. You know, don't acknowledge the other candidates. Act as if you're inevitable, you're above the fray, you're dignified, you're strong. So I think that was kind of the strategy. And, And obviously, In retrospect, it it didn't work. He wasn't getting traction anywhere. He wasn't getting traction in any of the early primary states or in national polls. He rebooted, quote unquote, rebooted his campaign several times. It became a running joke in Slate how many times he he had, you know, announced or, or leaked a memo suggesting that he was changing things up. But every time he did that, it was what he came back with was the same exact thing. Hmm. Yeah, I look at DeSantis' campaign and I see a couple of things happening. I see these constant reboots, but then I also see he was trying hard. Like he he decided, okay, I'm going to throw it all in in Iowa. 
And he really made an effort there. He got Kim Reynolds, the governor, to endorse him, which is huge. So you could see he was putting a lot of effort in trying to really lock up that state and make the case for himself. But then in the end, you look at what happened in the caucuses and you just think, huh, that didn't work. Yeah. And I think the one thing I will take credit for pointing out, and I forget even when I where I did point it out, but DeSantis's strategy, as you allude to, uh, in many ways, was to be half Trumpy, half MAGA, but also half establishment, and to hmm. and to secure the support and the endorsement of key figures in Iowa and and especially key figures in in the conservative press and in the conservative in conservative media, you know, places like the National Review. But the problem is that Trump's voters don't don't respect those sources of authority. That's kind of the whole point of being Donald Trump is that he has never had to, res- he doesn't have to respect any authority. He doesn't have to listen to anybody. And and the voters don't have to listen to anybody. And by voting for Trump, they make a statement about themselves, which is that I'm not going to listen to any of these people. They can't tell me what to do. Like, you can't tell me what to do is such a fundamental part of Donald Trump's success as a politician. And so in, you know, if you're trying to convert or persuade his voters uh, probably you're not going to do that by saying like, hey, look at how many of these powerful people who are already part of the rest of Republican establishment, look at how many of these people support me. When DeSantis lost Iowa, was it just clear that his campaign was kaput? Well, I think that's generous. I think it was clear well before that that his campaign was kaput. <laughs> uh, I think when it was getting to within a couple months of Iowa and he was, go- he was getting nowhere and at the same time, announcing that he had already visited, you know, 90 of the 99 counties and he was going to get to the other nine, you know, within a couple of weeks and cutting back on his appearances in other early states and focusing his campaign spending on the Iowa media markets. He realized he had to do that. He realized that if he's the the hardcore conservatives alternative to Trump, you know, that I was the, the place to prove that. Like a lot of what he did, it it made sense on paper. It just never went anywhere. Ron DeSantis, better in theory than in practice. Absolutely. Like there's kind of a thing called the Scott Walker test uh, that you have to pass in a presidential campaign. And that was uh, Scott Walker was another governor of a of a swing state or or what was close to being a swing state that would was Wisconsin in his case. And he had gained a lot of uh, supporters in the conservative movement by confronting uh, powerful liberal institutions. In in Walker's case, it was unions. In DeSantis' case, it was people who think that you should get a vaccine during a pandemic. But yeah, Walker had had got a lot of support for that reason, and had a lot of um, fiscal conservative donors who were who were really big on him. And then he kind of, then he got to the stage of the campaign where you actually have to introduce yourself to voters and appear on national television and televised debates. Uh, and he flopped because he's just kind of a boring personality. Um, and just kind of a dour looking individual. And so, yeah, you, uh, again, we had some guy, we had this guy who, who looked great on paper. And then once he actually got out there in front of voters who didn't already know who he was, who weren't already familiar with him, like the Florida voters are, he was a flop. We'll be back after a quick break. This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Whether you're driving, cooking, or doing laundry, Progressive knows the podcasts you listen to go best when they're bundled with another activity. Much like how their Progressive home and auto policies go best when they're bundled. Having these two policies together makes taking care of your insurance easier. And it could help you save, too. Customers who save by switching their home and car insurance to Progressive save nearly $800 on average. That's a whole lot of savings and protection for your favorite podcast listening activities, like going on a road trip, cooking dinner, or even hitting the home gym. Yep, your home and your car are even easier to protect when you bundle your insurance together. Find your perfect combo. Get a home and car insurance quote at Progressive.com today. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National average 12-month savings of $793 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2021 and May 2022. Potential savings will vary. This episode is brought to you by Rocket Money. Do you ever feel like money's just flying out of your account and you've got no idea where it's going? It is all those subscriptions 
Think about it. Between streaming services, fitness apps, delivery services, it is endless. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions. It monitors your spending and helps you lower your bills. You can see all of your subscriptions in one place. If you see something you don't want, you can cancel with a tap. You never have to get on the phone with customer service. They'll even try to get you a refund for the last couple of months. All you have to do is take a picture of your bill and Rocket Money will take care of the rest. Rocket Money has over 5 million users and has helped save its members an average of $720 a year with over $500 million in canceled subscriptions. So stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash whatnext. That's rocketmoney.com slash whatnext. Rocketmoney.com slash whatnext. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Around New Year's, a lot of us get obsessed with how to change ourselves. Maybe you're finally organizing your closet. Maybe you're taking supplements every morning. Maybe you're considering starting therapy. Therapy can help you find your strengths so you can ditch the extreme resolutions and make changes that really stick. If you're thinking of starting therapy, BetterHelp is here to help. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist. You can switch therapists anytime at no additional charge. Celebrate the progress you've already made and maybe make some more. Visit betterhelp.com slash whatnext today to get 10% off your first month. That is betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash whatnext. You know, in his announcement that he was suspending his campaign, DeSantis did this interesting maneuver that I just want to get your take on. He said it was clear to him that Republican voters supported Trump. And then he said, I will do what I've always said, which is I'll support the Republican nominee. What do you make of that? Well, I think a lot of people are interpreting that as him endorsing Trump. (laughs) So if he was trying to be coy with that, I'm not sure it worked because I've already seen a lot of headlines that say Ron DeSantis drops out, endorses Donald Trump. My my off-the-cuff guess about that would be that when you're in a campaign against somebody, you build up just a really great deal of just very sincerely felt personal animosity <laughs> toward those uh, <laughs> the other competitors in the campaign. I think politicians are insincere about a lot of things in calculating, but I think that they really do end up disliking the people they're running against, especially in primaries. Like that's that's real feeling. So that would be my guess is he just did not feel like saying Donald Trump at the moment. Uh, you know, I don't think it was certainly a coded reference to Nikki Haley because he feel I think he dislikes Ni- Nikki Haley just as much as Donald Trump, if not more, because if she hadn't, you know, run such a good campaign, probably he'd, he'd still be in it. He'd be doing a little better. He'd be a little more viable. Yeah. One thing that I took away from his announcement is that Trumpism is really tied up with Trump. Do you think that's a fair takeaway here? Absolutely. I think that it's even been, it's quantifiable. Uh, If you look at the candidates who are most closely allied with Trump, uh, have been endorsed by him, uh, make the most appearances with him, you could go through one by one and see that they do about four, I think it's four to five points worse than other Republican candidates, more generic Republican candidates who don't have the the um, degree of association with Trump. Uh, Yes, so absolutely. Trump, it's not just that that requires Trump to, to see it. It's that if, if you're Trump-like, but you're not Trump, you do even worse than any old Republican off the street. I think that it just is tied up with him and his personality, the way he speaks, uh, the record that he has with voters. You go to Trump rallies, people say, when he's talking, I feel like he understands me. I feel like he's he's up there representing me. And just uh, no one else has been able to recreate that. Um, and And when candidates like DeSantis go in and say, I'm going to be Trump without the messy personal life, without the chaos, uh, without the level of controversy. That's like the worst of both worlds, really. One thing I think it's important to talk about is that Ron DeSantis entered this race with a ton of money. Like, I think if you count donations he got for his gubernatorial campaign with the presidential ones, it's like he had over 200 million The Washington Post called it an unprecedented war chest, which just makes it clear there are people with money who really wanted a Trump alternative. Where are those people now? Well, they're probably 
trying to convince themselves that Nikki Haley has a path to victory. You know, to be fair to them in many races, having the most money, you know, having an overwhelming financial advantage means you're going to win the race. But that's not how presidential politics work. And it's especially not how presidential politics work in the Republican Party in the Donald Trump's era. And if anything, uh, sometimes having the support of, of wealthy Republican donors makes someone even less popular with Republican voters. So it's not just that the, the money is being set on fire. It actually helps Donald Trump uh, when, when these people try to get involved. So tomorrow the action shifts to New Hampshire, where Nikki Haley has really been trying to make the case for herself. Like even before this weekend, DeSantis had basically given up on New Hampshire. Yes. Do you think that New Hampshire is kind of the last stand for the people who are looking for some kind of Trump alternative in the Republican Party? Yeah, um, I think that, again, that might even be too generous. I, 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 as, as much as Haley has gotten attention in the press and as, and as well as she's done in New Hampshire, the, all the polls that have come out in the last couple weeks show her at least 10 points behind Donald Trump. Uh, and that's with uh, independent voters having access to the primary and New Hampshire traditionally supporting more moderate candidates uh, in the past. John McCain, kind of a, a classic example. I think that if this doesn't work in New Hampshire, if it doesn't work there, it's it's definitely not going to work anywhere else. That said, I think, you know, I do want to say polls are imprecise, uh, as we've learned in many elections recently, especially in a fluid situation like this one and in a in one particular state in a primary, which is going to have a fairly small turnout. So yeah, I, I don't think it would be I don't think it would be the craziest thing in the world to happen if Nikki Haley, Nikki Haley happens to win by one point in New Hampshire this week. That that's plausible. More concerning for for her and her supporters is that there's just nowhere else in on the entire map of the United States where she's seems like she has a chance of replicating that. Including South Carolina, which is her home state, which is where she was governor. Including South Carolina, where where Senator Tim Scott, uh, who was a presidential candidate early in this race, just in, endorsed Donald Trump. Even though Nikki Haley appointed him to the Senate. <laughs> exactly. It, it just goes to show how hard it, it's going to be for her or for anybody. If you're an anti-Trump Republican, this hasn't really been a good week for you. <laughs> no, but, we, you know, when have you had a good week? I guess there's there's like a couple here and there. <laughs> Yeah, if you're an anti-Trump Republican, I think that you're back uh, where you have been for some time, which is that you you need to support Joe Biden, uh, it, you know, which a lot of them have ended up doing, um, it, which, you know, it's a coalition. It's not something we're used to in United States politics is a coalition between people of of different parties and, and very different ideological commitments. It's actually pretty basic. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. Yeah. In this case, that's what's going on. And I think that that's where they're going to have to go back to, which I think is why Joe Biden, uh, <laughs> I think New York Magazine wrote a, a piece a few months ago uh, about the Biden campaign headquarters and, and the lack of panic that is taken uh, has taken hold on the ground there, uh, the, the relatively mellow levels of uh, attitude that they have going. And I think that's a big part of it. Um, once the Trump skeptical Republicans realize, like, this is going to be our nominee. It's going to be Trump again. Once independent voters, like there's been some polling that suggests that independent vote voters just truly do not believe that the Republican Party would nominate Trump again. He keeps losing and his candidates keep losing and he's under indictment in about 700 different places. Once people realize like, oh, yeah, well, OK, wow, they really are going to do this again. They really are going to nominate Trump again. There is a possibility that they're going to flip back to supporting Joe Biden, even though they don't really care for his presidency because of inflation or because he's too old or whatever. And that's kind of Joe, what Joe Biden is, is banking on. Ben Mathis Lilly, super grateful for you hopping on the line a little late on a Sunday with me. Thanks. Glad to be here as always. Ben Mathis Lilly is a senior writer for Slate. And that's the show. What Next is produced by Paige Osborne, Elena Schwartz, Rob Gunther, Madeline Ducharme, and Anna Phillips. We are led by Alicia Montgomery with a little boost from Susan Matthews. Ben Richmond is the Senior Director of Podcast Operations here at Slate. And I'm Mary Harris. Thanks for listening. Catch you back here next time. <laughs> 